You're about to hear a brief conversation with an incredible actor. Part autobiographical journey, part literary analysis, and part late night chat in the theatre bar. This is Hear Me Out, and I'm your host, Lucy Eaton. Please welcome to the stage, Mark Bonner. And we're huggy ones actors, aren't we? We're not untactile. Everybody, human beings are tactile, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, we are particularly, yes. But I think that that's been the one of the biggest sort of hurdles for me is not to hug people I love not even people I love but people I like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my memory Mark is that you are a good hugger I love hugging <laughs> who doesn't I mean it's yeah. I think I'm a good hugger I would you know throw my hat in the ring and say I, I think remember I'm a you hugger. being a good hugger too uh, thank you so much thank you Mark no I didn't have to fish for that at all <laughs> and a good supplier of Barocca as well well I recounted this tale to my family just the other day I mean my favourite memory of you for all time will be when fellow actress Iris Roberts gave you a Barocca and you didn't realise yeah. it was Barocca so, what did I think it was a sweetie or something I can't remember what? I think you thought well, it was like a multi-bit it was like a multi that you could just uh, suck. Like a chewy, yeah, exactly. And then you started frothing at the mouth like a madman. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was exciting. It was like something out of the play that we were it doing. It was indeed, time. yeah. Oh, that was lovely. That show, wasn't it? Uh, Very happy. Yeah. show. Yeah, I mean, for for the listener who does not know, Mark and I worked together on my very first professional job. Was it? Which was the Duchess of Malfi at the Old Vic. God, I didn't know that. Yeah. So it was that job where I think on your first job. Everything is so exciting. Hopefully everything's always exciting, but everything is so exciting and new yeah. and you want to experience all the things. And for instance, on press night, there's a whole thing where like everyone gives each other press night cards, right? Mm. And I remember for Malfi, someone, it might have been you, Mark, you might have been the guilty party. Someone was like, I think we should save the environment and not all give each other a load of cards that are ultimately going to go oh, in the bin. that's very good. Yes, yes, very good, Mark. But yeah. I was like, don't take my first experience of this tradition away from me. <laughs> and because there is a reference to apricots in the Duchess of Malfi, I recall Eve Best giving everyone some apricots instead of cards. <laughs> but what are we going to talk about today? Oh, today. Today? We are going today to talk about Hamlet. Yes, we are. And now, when you said, when you asked me about, uh, about doing this, I thought, oh, fucking everybody's going to be doing a Hamlet speech but you said nobody's doing a Hamlet speech well so. all we've got actually so far is at another point in the series Giles Torreira wanted to talk to me about a sort of lost Hamlet scene oh. that he found in a quarto once between Horatio and Gertrude oh really yeah which then just led to a really fabulous conversation really about Shakespeare so actually no one has really delved into the great omelette well that's I, I consider it a pleasure and a privilege in that case Yes, so uh, specifically Rogue and Peasant Slave, and the reason I'm choosing that speech is because I kind of know most of it, um, but <laughs> so I wouldn't have to learn it. You can talk with some knowledge. I can talk with some kind of degree of knowledge, but also I, I studied it for a term, for a whole term at, at drama school. We did a speech and a scene, mm. and I did Rogue and Peasant Slave and the nunnery scene. Where were you at drama school, Mark? Uh, Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, which is now known as the Conservatoire, the Scottish Conservatoire. Mm, for we must have much more pretentious names for our drama We schools. must, <laughs> yes. It's not sufficient <laughs> to say music and drama because we encompass many more things. I don't exactly know what... What a conservatoire is. Yeah, what, how many more things other than music and drama do you need to encompass to call yourself a conservatoire? We'll never know. I don't think anybody can really get... Especially anybody Scottish can really get over saying conservatoire. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it, it was... Um, I, it's a fascinating... I mean, you know, people have been studying and talking about Hamlet for centuries uh, ad infinitum mm. because it, it's a compelling play and it's a compelling part but also uh, apart from that the language it comes back to me this um, I'll find myself every now and again if I can't get to sleep or first thing in the morning when I've woken up if if I'm not at home because the kids will wake mm. me up and get me up but if I find myself idle it'll pop into my head sometimes it really warrants revisiting because it's infinite in its depth and it's infinite in its interpretation 
and its cadence. I've watched a lot of people doing it since since we since you asked me to do this. I thought I'll go and see mm. what everybody else does with it, and um, there are some brilliant. Uh, versions of it on YouTube. Who is your favourite? Ah, Who's your favourite rendition? I wondered if you'd ask me that. Well, <laughs> I think, you know, for sense and meter and um, kind of force of nature, you'd have to go with Brana because I worked with um, I'm going to call him Ken. <laughs> he calls me Marky. Oh, <laughs> that's more of a name drop than calling him Ken. He, he, but he adds a Y to the end of everybody's name. <laughs> he, you know. What would he call me? Ah, uh, well, there you go. That's a that's a million dollar question. I've no idea. Dear heart, probably. Um, oh, I'll take that. Yeah, but he. I did Richard the Third with him at, mm. in Sheffield. I can't remember what year it was. Ninety eight, maybe. And he is a force of nature. He's he's incredible to to watch. There's very few actors who do this, but they kind of seem to have a direct line between the spirit of Shakespeare and what comes out their mouth. You know, they summon it up from the earth. They're mm. so fucking rooted. And he is... Um, he's one of them. Right. He's incredible at it. His facility... But his instinct and his force, mm. his sheer force. Barbara Jefford is another one, whom she was in the same show. Barbara Jefford is... And Ken used to watch Barbara and go, she's fucking amazing, isn't she? Oh, fuck. But yeah, so Ken's, Ken's was in his film version. Yes, the famous film version. Yeah, I haven't watched the whole film for a long, long time, but mm. um, I watched uh, To Be or Not To Be and I watched Rogan Peasant Slave. He's just, yeah, he has it. But I'll tell you who else does a brilliant version, or, although it's not quite the full speech, is Tim Minchin. What? I didn't know he was uh, an actor, but it kind of makes sense, really. I think he, he studied it. He went to a youth group at Perth Theatre School in Australia. Oh, I'm going to YouTube that. And he did a that. great version of it. it really, yeah. I just found it last night. I mean, there's a lot of shit as well, it has to be said. Well, I mean, this is one of my pet peeves about Hamlet. We have this total obsession with Hamlet being a thinker, not a doer. And, you know, that he's just totally cerebral and lives uh -huh. in his brain. And that makes for quite a boring character. Yes. And I actually think in the sort of time I've spent looking at the text... I always feel like he's absolutely a doer. He's just in a very specific moment in his life where he's paralysed by a very certain time. And he's paralysed for good reason. For this, good reason. And this speech, yeah. in fact, this speech is the, is the, is the most laid bare he is about why he's paralysed because he's not, you know, for starters, he's seen... He's seen a ghost, for starters. He's seen not Let's only a ghost... Let's just start that. He's, yeah, he's the... yeah, but he's seen the, go the ghost of his father... His dead father, who he dis discovers through that ghost, has been murdered yeah. by his uncle. But then, you know, not only that, but he's thinking, oh, well, hang on a minute, as he says in Rogue and Peasant Slave, he, he says, the spirit that I've seen may be the devil. Because he doesn't know, he you know he's not sure. You know he's got mm. he's got these opportunities, or he's been told this, so he's thinking, yep, yeah, I suspect it as much. Should I kill him? You know, um, um, mm -hmm. now might I do it, Pat? But he's he's uh, stifled by the fact that he's not sure because you you wouldn't be it, would you, if you saw a ghost? It wasn't usual back then to see no. ghosts. It's never been usual. It's just as fucking scary as it would be now. Yeah, and also he's not a killer. Like I think a lot yeah. of the time as well, what I see is people this whole comparing Hamlet to Fortinbras. You know, being like. Hamlet and Fortinbras are foils of each other. And you're like, yeah, as in like they're both probably roughly the same age, maybe. Mm. But actually Fortinbras is like already the leader of his mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. He's a warrior. He's like a general. He leads armies. He does like Hamlet is a university student. Mm. He's an academic. The notion of actually having to kill someone now is so out of the realm of what he probably knows. But again, coming back to like what makes him so interesting exactly it's why this speech is such a great choice what makes him interesting is that he is actually a man going i'm really annoyed that i can't that i don't know what to do mm. 
because actually that is not like me. I am normally, you know, we see him be impulsive at other times and he's sort of going, why can't I figure out how to, what choice to make here or how to do it or Uh railing against this particular situation? Uh This is one of the occasions when he does make a a decision. He decides to, uh, well, he lays it out at the end of the speech, he decides to play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle and he's going to instruct the players on how to do that and then he'll know. Mm. You know, then he'll know for sure. Mm. And he does, he, he, you know, he does find because the uncle runs off. Mm. So what made you, back when you were at drama school and they were like, you're going to do our speech for a whole term, mm. did it have to be from Hamlet? Or what made you initially go, I'm a pick, Rogue and Peasant Slayer? Yeah, we, no, we were studying the first folio. Right. We Did we choose or were we given? Do you know what? I can't remember now. Um, but no, I was very. I think we must have chosen because I really wanted to do the nunnery scene, Mm-mm. and I really loved Rogue and Peasant Slave. Mm. I thought the others, uh, you know, although the others are amazing speeches, I think Rogue and Peasant Slave has such an engine underneath it because, because of what has just happened, because he's witnessed the player king, you know, emoting about Hecuba. Mm. It's really moved him, but it's also challenged him. And there's a proper engine underneath it where he is examining not only kind of himself and his lack of action, uh, but also it's an examination out with him. It's an examination of of what it means to be a man and mm. and how they speak and how women were spoken of you know uses the word whore and scullion mm. which was a, a kitchen maid and drab another word for whore he it, you know like a whore unpack my heart with words you know those those kind of things are really eye-opening about you know obviously misogyny um at the time there would have been but but the man versus woman debate you're right i maybe i just haven't studied another shakespeare play actually in as much detail as I have Hamlet, but I do feel like it's a play where you're constantly hearing that very specific brand of misogyny, which is basically numerous examples of a man being like, I want to not be do this thing that's womanly. Ugh, mm. Like, I did a thing that was like a woman. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I feel like that crops up all the time, that sort of terminology. We're still, you know, as I'm sure you know, but we're still moving mm. away from, or trying to move away from that nonsense, you know, you big girl's blouse. Just, yeah, you big, man you up. big Jesse, man up, yeah. Idols of my favourite band, Idols have got a song, uh, the name of which I, escapes me at the moment because I'm mm. old, but um, it's a, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's about it, that very thing about masculinity, toxic masculinity. Mm. But yes, it's still very much a part of of our makeup. But yes, back in that day, what it, it was, um, yeah, it, I'm sure it was far, far worse. But the, it's fascinating because the male equivalent was action and. Mm you know, um, strength and decision-making and... And aggression. Boldness and aggression, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is what he doesn't have either and why why he's berating himself. Yeah. So what's the best part, Mark? What, oh. what hits home the most? I think... I, I like the opening, actually. I, I think the whole wonder of uh, him about the player king... There was a there was a line I was saying this morning. Oh yes, I love the I love the little section. What would he do had he the motive and cue for passion that I have? I love he would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech. A lot of I've noticed in a lot of the versions you kind of uh, because he's working himself up a little bit at this uh, stage. A lot of the versions that I've watched they don't quite land these this little f- sort of four lines here he would drown the stage with tears cleave the general ear with horrid speech make mad the guilty and appall the free confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears those quite don't quite land all the time but that's a hell of a four lines there five lines there about what would happen if the actor had the had the meat and bones to work with that Hamlet does, you know? Great choice. 
Is there a bit you think is particularly hard to get through as an actor? Well, all, I think always the challenge for this, the lead up to O Vengeance. I studied it with uh, Hugh Hodger at um, RSAMD, who's now the head of the whole school, but and he used to be a, he was a director at the Traverse and stuff. And right. I think he said, I think I have a memory of him saying that O Vengeance is sometimes cut, but I like it because it's it works perfectly with you've got four beats of the pentameter uh, after that to have a think about what you've just done mm. and then turn the corner into why what an ass yes, am I? Yes, because it's a totally unfinished line. It's a tiny little Yeah, clip. so I mean for those that don't know, again the, the, the when Shakespeare writes in verse anyway um, there are five beats to the line so, oh what a rogue and peasant slave am I? Yeah. The first thing you do when you look at a speech if you're playing Hamlet or one of the first things you do is you go through and you see where there aren't five beats. Then you have to tell, you have to decide why. You can't ask Shakespeare. Um, so you have to decide what his intention was in leaving that gap. Yeah. So Hecuba's another one. With forms to his conceit and all for nothing for Hecuba. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's a few in this speech. That is absolutely one of my favourite things about Shakespeare. I love mm. that the, what the verse enables us is these sort of secret stage directions. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, they're, they are secret stage directions. And there's a, there's a few in this speech. And even when you try and go against it, there's there's one that... there's Now and again you can go, yeah, but I could put the stress... I could... And you, you can do it. You can do the stress against... You can go against the pentameter and mm. see where it gets you but mm. usually you find yourself you're kind of throwing yourself a bit of a curveball yeah there was one what was it that I was looking at this morning oh I know zunes I should take it for it cannot be but I am pigeon liver done lack gall to make oppression bitter so it's it's a, it scans perfectly yeah but he's just been talking about being a coward am I a coward zunes it cannot be but you could argue you could put the stress on am, although it would go against the pentameter. But I am pigeon livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter or air this. I should have fatted all the region's kites with yeah. the slaves awful. You know, it's, it, 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 I am like that. I am. Mm. So that I was kind of pondering that this morning. And then I went back to the meter and thought, no, no, you can still get the sense of that. You can still get that sense. But I am pigeon livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. And it still works. It still works. So yeah. don't try and be a smart arse. Sure, you could do it another way, but you're probably doing the lazy thing. There is there is a way of doing it as it has been written. Which is why which is why Brana's version, I think, still for me is the is the best that I've seen because mm. he pretty much doesn't stop. He stops where he's told to almost always, and and he he motors through it, and it works because. That's Hamlet. That's how, you know, Shakespeare decided he was going to be and he wanted him to be. And Ken does that the best, I think, you know. Mm. That, I think, is one of the challenging things as well. Definitely one of the challenging things with Hamlet is that it is so done now. It's been so mm. overdone that I think you get a lot of actors maybe who want to play it. And the top priority becomes, how do I make this my Hamlet? Yes. And in doing that, you end up maybe doing just not the right Hamlet. Yeah. You know, you will bring your Hamlet to it because every actor is different and, you know, yes, invariably we bring our own personalities to something. But if you try to work against what's been done before, you end up with just a less good version. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Just fucking speak the words. Speak them well. Speak them knowing what you're mm. mostly talking about and uh, and get on with it because it's the play is the thing. <laughs> Very good. Very good. And that's the end of the episode. And cut. <laughs> it's true, though. I mean, Shakespeare said it, and he was the, he's the best writer that's arguably ever existed, you know. Not really arguably. It is worth saying, though, that I don't advocate that no one should ever do anything bold. Mm. You know, strong new character choices can be totally thrilling and a concept can be totally thrilling. Of course, of course it can, of course In it another can. episode of this series, I chat to Maddie Hill and she talks about speech from Cymbeline because she was in the Globe production where they actually renamed it Imogen. And that had a very heavy 
design and look and concept and it worked so well and what I think most crucially it did was it was a classic you know it made it really relatable for young people yeah and it's the same for the Don Mar the all-female trilogies that they did yeah so I think there's a place for it it's funny I'm, I'm trying to I mean I haven't seen a lot of Shakespeare productions in my life, which probably is a, a, a terrible marker of my... You're um, fired. Uh, You're fired from the podcast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I've been in a few. I've done... I, I've not been in a lot, but... I, and I, I'll go back to Kenny Love again, but to be in that to be in that show with him... I mean, he's an incredible actor. He, if, if you ever get a chance to see him on stage, go, because I'm not just talking about Shakespeare. I mean, I, I saw him in Ivanov or Ivanov, and he was playing a man who was suffering from depression. And he had this astonishing speech about about not feeling anything, which is what well, if you've suffered from depression, that's what it feels like. You have you can't feel anything. You feel heavy and low and there is not you don't feel anything for anything. You know, it's a fucking horrible disease and yeah. he had this speech this incredible speech about it and he was electrifying in that show really really incredible so it's not just Shakespeare mm. I, you know he, he's a, he's one of our very very best I think but to get back to Shakespeare watching him in Richard III was a was a lesson was a real proper him and Barbara were just so incredible ballsy front foot you could take your breath away. What a gift for you to be in a rehearsal room with them. Oh, man, it was great. It really it is really great. one of the greatest privileges as an actor. Yeah. Is the rehearsal room bit, like Absolutely. getting to see these people so yeah, yeah, up yeah. close. Yeah, how they do it, how they get through it. And it's fascinating that the, the kind of the mixture of people's styles as well, how people approach things. Mm. You know, I, I, years and years ago, I did uh, two plays at the at the RSC mm. and one of them, the actor who I had most of my stuff with came on the first day of rehearsals with his whole performance. Oh, he was more of an old school actor, but he arrived with all his business and he, he was kind of immovable on it. I was first time at the RSC and I was like... <gasps> Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. And the other show that I was doing was Tales from Ovid um, with Tim Supple and Melly Still, mm. which was entirely kind of devised by us, you know. So it was the complete antithesis to what was going on in the other rehearsal. Yeah. Room. It just felt like death every time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, fucking hell. Well, I guess it's also, it's the interaction, isn't it? If they've decided, it's not just about seeing them evolve, which is lovely, but it feels like you are affecting them. If they've already decided, you can't affect them. Yeah, what do I do? What, what do I didn't... I was really... I mean, I was I was young and, yeah, as I say, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed and didn't really have a, a clue how to deal with this. Mm. But I just... I, I did the best I could. But while at the same time, you talking about bringing young people into to Shakespeare and stuff and, and invigorating them and enlivening them... Mm. Tales from Ovid was uh, an incredible thing to be a part of for that very reason. Uh, and they're even older than Shakespeare. You know, that's where Shakespeare got a lot of his source material was Ovid. And to be a part of those stories was kind of remarkable. Really you know? thrilling. Oh, God, yeah. That whole thing about Shakespeare, people being afraid they won't understand it and and being, you know, um, frightened of even coming to see it. And I, I, I think that goes, that, that has to change at school. That has to mm. go back to school. Kids kids can understand it. It's not, you know, physics. It's not higher physics or chemistry. It's it's language. And you know, mm. you, you can, f the, the most wonderful thing about it, certainly in, in iambic pentameter, is you can feel it. Mm. You know, you, you there's a rhythm to it, so you that's inherent in all of us. It's the rhythm of life, you know. It's the da, 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 da. it's the way we speak, you know. Mm. It's, I think that's uh, it's long been considered as the thing of the uh, posher, cleverer people, and it's not at all that. It's the it's the opposite of that, Shakespeare. It's the language of the of the common person, you know. Mm, mm, mm. I used to, when I was younger, my parents are very much not in the biz in any way. They were both dentists, but they <laughs> loved the theatre. And so yeah. when we were kids, we were taken to 
a show at the Globe and a show at the RSC probably once a year. And I remember at that very young age, I'd have to almost have a little synopsis, but that was okay. Like, that was the fun of it, is I'd sort of have, in the car on the way there, I'd be reading, okay, so what's going to happen in this? Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so certainly when you're very young, I think, you know, it can seem a lot, but there's ways that it can be made more accessible. And you listen, you'll, you'll miss a lot as well, and mm. that's okay because it's... The language is so dense. I mean, that's our job, you know, is is to make it clearer. But you're yes. still not, even mm. as clear as we make it, you're still not going to get everything because it's fucking, you know. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I? Even that, you're going rogue, okay, peasant slave. And then, you know, I'm already on the next line. So you're going to mess bits. You have to concentrate, yeah. yes, if you want to kind of hear the story you have to you have to be switched on but then what if you don't want to be switched on what are you doing in a theater you know it reaps rewards um if you go to the theater but yes it's it's our job to make it clear but it doesn't belong to posh people who are clever who speak like john gielgud yeah it's it's kind of evolved over time, I think, the way that people approach Shakespeare. And it's it's kind of evolving in the right way, I feel. Mm -hmm, you know? Absolutely. I think it's almost time to hear the speech, but one last question. You haven't actually played Hamlet, have you? No, I was, um, I was offered Hamlet once, um, many, many years ago, only when I was about two or three years at drama school. And... Do you know what? I can't remember why I turned it down at the time. It was an outdoor production. I think I didn't feel it would be very good. And I thought, I'd rather not. I think it's a poison, not a poison chalice, it's mm. a double-edged sword. Mm. It, it's such a well-known play. And you are kind of almost setting yourself up. You're you're setting yourself up for people to talk about your Hamlet. Yeah, you know? yeah. And that's not the way you want to... I remember Finbar Lynch um, saying to... Uh, who we both yeah. know, the lovely Finbar Exquisite Lynch. Exquisite Finbar uh, Lynch. Oh, he certainly is. And he's a great fucking Shakespearean actor. He's a great actor. But mm. um, we did Antony and Cleopatra together at the National before um, uh, Malfi. And um, he played... Um, oh, God! Antony and Cleopatra, uh, uh, the one that has the barge speech. Oh, I'm not going to be good at this. I'm not good at Antony and Cleopatra. Oh, well, I should be because I've been in it twice. Um, <laughs> sorry to the, all those Shakespeare aficionados out there. Anyway, uh, uh, mm. Finbar said that a, a couple of his friends said, how are you going to do it? And he was like, what do you mean, how am I going to do it? I'm just going to say it. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it's a big, it's a big, well-known speech in Shakespeare, the barge speech. And, uh, you know, they were kind of keen for his take on it. And he was like, I don't have a take on it. I'm just going to fucking say the words, you know. I feel like that is classic Finn to have someone yes. say. Oh, yeah, you, you can imagine him saying it. What do you mean? I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to say the words. Yeah, <laughs> looking at you like he wants to kill you. <laughs> what, do you mean? what do you mean? How am I going to do that? <laughs> I always yes. think, yeah, he is Finn. such an ex like such an incredible actor and such an intimidating presence, but such a softie as well. Oh, totally. And the hard exterior was really cracked when we were doing Malfi because do you remember he had a bike accident on the first day of tech and I found him. Oh, did you find him? Yeah. And I had to sit with him until the ambulance arrived. God, I didn't, I'd forgotten that. Bloody hell. Thank fuck he was all right. You know, I mean, relatively speaking. But I, mean, I love how they had to end up because he broke his collarbone or something. The whole character, you know, he was playing the cardinal, wasn't he? Which is obviously yeah. like the villain of the he piece. He was in a sling they, for the, the rest of it. Yeah, they he? created this like period sling, which made him look very, yeah. like a fabulous <laughs> character choice. Even more ominous. He had a one-handed knife fight with me. <laughs> yeah, whole fight scenes had to be re-choreographed. I was like, oh, fuck, this really shows me up in a bad way. <laughs> You're like, I have, I've never can't, forgiven him you can't, for you can't, <laughs> making no, you me can't. look so weak on stage. <laughs> right, anyway, the speech, the speech in question, the speech. Oh, no, no now I have to fucking do Read it. Read it to us. <laughs> right, the Please, speech. Please, let us I've turned it. you. I've turned you off. Fine. Your camera, I mean, because I don't want anybody staring at me because I'm getting embarrassed. And I'm going to take my headphones out as well, so I can't hear anything either. So Lovely. <laughs> can't wait. I've got to psych myself up for it, darling. Of course. <sighs> what a rogue and pissed. 
isn't slave, am I? Is it not monstrous that this player here but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage warned? Tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a murderous voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit and all for nothing, for Hecuba. <laughs> Was Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do, had he the motive and cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty, and appall the free, confound the ignorant, and amaze indeed the very faculty of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy-metalled rascal, peak like Jonah dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this? Ha! Ah! As soon as I should take it for it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter, or ere this I should have fatted all the region's kites with this slave's awful, bloody, bloody villain. Remorseless, lecherous, treacherous, kindless villain! Oh, vengeance! <laughs> Why, what an ass am I? <laughs> oh, this is most brave. That I, the son of the dear father murdered, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab, a scullion. Fie upon foe. <sighs> About my brain, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. Though murder, for murder, though it hath no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tend him to the quick if he but blench. I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be a devil and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. But I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Hear Me Out is a Lucy Eaton Productions podcast. 
music composed by Tristram Kay, and artwork by Rebecca Bright. If you've enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe. And I know it's a mini faff, but if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, a rating and a review would mean the world. Finally, you can find us on social media at Pod Hear Me Out, and we're on YouTube, where you can catch visual clips of the show. Right, that's it. Lucy Eaton, exiting stage left. <laughs>